last episode we uncovered an error, with the only means of remedy being a 50mm extension of the baseboard. So, despite having painted it twice already, that means we're going to have to break out the vent paint once again. Hello everyone, welcome to episode 3 of my N-Gage layout build. If you haven't seen episode 1 and 2, I would recommend you go and watch those before continuing with this one. But to sum things up, we have a baseboard with track down and all the electronics done. One hurdle we have found is that once we added the magnets and the buffer stops, the sidings aren't long enough for us to run the full 533 ingle nook shunting layout. That means our baseboard is going to have to get a little bit bigger. On the bright side, who could say no to an extra two inches of wood? So let's begin. So ladies and gentlemen, that means once again it's time to break out the gentle acoustic background music and watch me take some large bits of wood and chop them up until they're much smaller bits of wood. This time we start off by cutting out not three but four pieces of wood. You can see me gluing in the end just here and then using the fourth piece as a brace on the inner side of the extension. The inner piece significantly increases the amount of bond area I have between the extension and the baseboard and once I've driven some screws into the side of all these transverse pieces the extension itself should be pretty robust. I'm trying to make the best of a bit of a bad situation here so I'm going to use this extension as a handle and it's not going to be covered by the lid. That means I need it to be pretty secure, so I'm driving a screw into each of the transverse pieces. And then you can see here I'm driving in two screws from the inner piece of wood into the baseboard so the whole thing's not going to fall off. Obviously if I'm hooking my hand under here and carrying the baseboard around and it failed, then my railway is going to crash down to the floor and I'm going to be a very sad panda. Once that was done, I trimmed out a piece of 9mm ply, the same thickness as the topper for the rest of the baseboard, and then glued that down. And once it was glued, again, we're going to run some screws in. For the lid, it's probably not so necessary, but it's just nice to go for a belt and braces solution. Um, again, using the countersink bit there so that we don't split the wood so much. And once that's all together, we can start trying to trim the end down. And uh, you can see me there using a ruler just to check that it's all flush and it seems to be pretty good. I also sanded down the sides um, because I'm trying to blend in that edge uh, using some wood filler as well so that the join between the two pieces of the baseboard isn't quite so visible. And once that's done, that represents the actual woodworking stage done. So I'm gonna take out those brass inserts and give it a final sand here. I've donned the sexy boiler suit just for the occasion. And once that was done, I ran through the same process as before for painting. Uh, obviously I'm not going to show it again, I'm kind of emotionally scarred just for having to do it in person all those times. One of the last mechanical bits to do is to cut out a piece of foam and uh, get that glued on. Just using PVA as per usual because it's foam safe. And once that's nice and secure we're going to break out some more of the chocolatey goodness. It's really just to cover up any gaps left by the actual ground coverage, which is going to come later on. I cut out three small pieces of track with my new track cutters, which is an awful lot easier than using the Dremel to cut everything. 
and I just got those glued down with PVA. And once was, that was done and with the base bond painted, that means I can carry out the oh so satisfying job of running the little brass inserts back in. I really like these things and um, they give you a nice professional finish so happy to uh, yeah run those back in and get everything looking nice and complete again. And then the final stage of this whole process is to just trim down the ends of the rails on the three new pieces of track and get them to be roughly the same length by eye. It doesn't matter 100% to be honest because we're going to be putting some buffer stops here and uh, they kind of hide the ends of the rails anyway. So there we have it, we have our three pieces of track, they're all connected up with metal fish plates and glued down and I have taped up the baseboard ready for painting. The baseboard is now extended and we can fit enough wagons in to do the Inglenook shunting puzzle and along the way we've learned a valuable lesson about planning out our layout. The next stage is to paint the track and for me that's going to be a three stage process. First of all I'm going to paint the track with a brown aerosol, then we're going to dry brush the sleepers to bring out a little bit of the detail and finally we will use a homemade rusty brown wash to weather the rails. What colour you like your track is a very personal thing and you can go out into the real world and find examples of track looking in all kinds of conditions from very new to very very worn down and old. For me I'm going for a slightly worn look as I want the depot to represent something that is quite run down and starting to be used less often than it was in the past. One thing I would recommend is to make a small plaque with some rails on it which you can use as a test for how you want to do your rail weathering and also your ballast. You can see here I've used lots of different kinds of ballast and experimented with ways to weather it and even tested some static grass and other materials. I did this because I didn't want to commit to something and then realize after I'd done my layout that I wasn't happy with it. So I did this first to make sure I was going to be pleased with the result. So with that said, let's crack on with the first stage of painting the track. This stuff here is sleeper grime by a company called Railmatch. When working with miniatures, I tend to avoid using spray cans as they're a bit weather dependent but in this case it makes sense as I don't have an airbrush and we have a fair bit of ground to cover. Luckily for me, at this point in time it was also the middle of summer, so the weather was pretty good. Insert grumpy comment about normal British summertime here. The key here, as with any time you're using an aerosol, is to use light coats. Don't spray for too long in one location because it's very easy to clog up the fine detail on these rails, particularly around the chairs. You can see me checking pretty frequently to make sure that there isn't too much paint building up and any danger of running or just having far too much paint in one area. One piece of advice here, as this is a lack of paint, make sure you give it at least a few seconds before getting your nose in there or you'll lose more than a few precious brain cells. I really like this sleeper grime colour. It's got a nice dirty tone, but it's not too dark. When you're working in such a small scale, you actually want things to be lighter than they are in real life, otherwise they look a little bit strange. This paint is also really, really matte and takes the plasticky shine off of the sleepers. It instantly transforms it from something that looks like a toy to something you can get your eye right down close to and it looks pretty realistic. Now. Let's look at the paints we're going to use for the next weathering stage. For the first stage we're mixing up a quite thin brown wash. I'm just using two Citadel colours, Rise of Rust and do Bold Brown, but you can use anything you have to hand really. Just mix it up until it looks kind of like skimmed milk and you're in about the right ballpark. We'll also be using a light brown colour for a dry brush. Again, I'm using a Citadel colour, but any kind of light brown acrylic you have will be more than suitable. First we're going to use some of that light brown to dry brush the sleepers, 
and we're going to start to see a little bit of the detail coming out and just some general color variation which helps to make the rails look a little bit less uniform. And the second step is to use that ready brown wash we created and to apply it pretty liberally to the sides of the rails. We don't want to see it dripping but we need to have enough paint on there so that it actually draws itself into the detail of the rail and around the chairs and is, acts as more of a wash than a just a paint. This takes a little bit of time and once you think you're done you're going to see the rails from the other side and realize that you're only 50% of the way there. So this is the side of the rails that I've just painted. As you can see when it dries it really just becomes a subtle orange sort of uh, tint towards the base of the rail. This side I haven't painted yet. So hopefully that kind of highlights the look I'm going for. Rather than it being a very obviously rusted mess, it's um, really just a, a suggestion of um, a bit of a warmer colour towards the base of the rail. So that's the rail weathering done, and I'm really pleased with how they look. Obviously how you want your rails to look is a bit of a matter of taste, and you can find any number of pictures online or go and look at actual railways and see rails of all different colours and in all different conditions, but for me, I'm happy with where they are. I'm so happy, I'm almost disappointed to have to clean the tops of them, but that's a necessary stage because otherwise our trains won't work. To get all the paint off of the top of the rails, we're going to use a track rubber. I bought the type towards the lower half of the screen from my local hobby shop. It's a weird kind of spongy material, and I would say avoid it at all costs. Just seems to make a lot of mess without doing a lot. The standard hard pico rubber, which is towards the top of the screen, is the one you want. Now we can watch the rails as they get cleaned. And I do have to say it looks super satisfying to have the tops of the rails come up nice and shiny in super speed. One thing I'm not showing here is once you're done using the track rubber to remove the paint, it's a good idea to come back with some isopropyl alcohol and give it a good rub with a cotton bud because you'll be surprised how much extra stuff you can actually get off with a bit of a chemical clean. And now, after that, our track is finished. It's weathered and looking good, and in theory, train should be able to run on top of it. So, the track is painted and weathered, and I think it's looking really good. It's just the right amount of decrepit for me. We're getting very, very close to putting the ballast down onto the track, but before we do that, there are some details we need to put down onto the layout. The first one is, as the ballast is going to cover the magnets which sit in between the sleepers, we need something that's going to mark their position. And here's one of the tiny little flags I made to do that job. It's made out of a piece of paper and some brass rod, and I made three in total, one to go next to each of my magnetized areas. The next detail to add is the buffer stops. These are the bog standard offering from Pico. They're super cheap and come in three parts, molded in a really weird brown plastic. I gave them a spray with the Rail Match Sleeper Grime to take away the shine and give them a nice colour. And now I'm using some super glue to attach them to the track. I think they look pretty good considering they're super simple. And once they were fully stuck down, I followed the same process as the track to weather them using the dry brush and the rusty wash. Unfortunately, I don't have pictures of them after they were weathered, so you're just gonna have to close your eyes and imagine for now. If you remember the track plan, we had a tunnel on the left-hand side of the layout which joins to the outside world. As we're preparing for ballasting, and the ballast is gonna run inside the tunnel, I decided that I wanted to plant it now because if I wasn't careful with my ballasting and it ran wider than the tunnel was going to be, then I'm not going to be able to get it to sit down properly. 
This tunnel here is a good old Metcalf kit and it goes together really nicely. In terms of the structure, I added some pieces of spare card to keep the walls nice and strong because I'm going to be using plaster to make the landform behind them and I don't want them to buckle. I've done a tiny bit of weathering with some oil paints and dry pigments. I'm not entirely happy with it, but it will do for now and I can touch it up once the layout starts coming together in terms of the scenery. Now, with the detail bits down, we're going to take this opportunity to give everything a final test before adding the ballast. I've added the in-progress converted engine shed I'm working on for a bit of scenery, and for now I'm just randomly moving some wagons around here and there to make sure the track is working as expected. It's much easier to rectify any issues now before we put the ballast on rather than waiting till after it's glued down. The sequence is totally unedited, so you can see how the magnets often require a pretty sharp, unrealistic wiggle to get them to release. I'm not 100% satisfied with the setup, but I think it's the best compromise I can achieve in such a small scale. And I think to have reliable hands-free decoupling at all is a nice stage to be at. It's just unfortunate that to do it reliably, I have to wiggle the locomotives around and I'm sure to scale the G's that would be pulled by the loco crew would probably melt their brains. Either way, thinking of this as maybe more of a toy than a proper layout, i.e. supposed to be used as an ingle neck shunting puzzle, it achieves everything we want, so I'm going to call it good for now in terms of the track functionality and we're going to move on to the next stage. With the testing of the track and the magnets as successful as I think we're going to get it, it's time to move on to ballasting. This stage is one I've been looking forward to since the start of the layout as it's something I've never done before apart from on that very small test piece I showed you earlier. All the videos I've seen of it on YouTube look super satisfying, so with that said, let's crack on. To get the ballast done, obviously we're going to need the ballast itself. In this case, I'm using some fine grade stuff from Woodland Scenics. We need some isopropyl alcohol and some thin PVA glue. You can just water down normal PVA or buy it pre-watered down in this uh, Scenic cement bottle from Woodland Scenics again. A few pipettes to add the alcohol and the glue, brushes, a spoon and something to put your uh, glue into. In this case, I'm using an old yogurt pot. When it comes to actually ballasting the track, we're just going to pick up a little bit of the ballast on a spoon and then spread that around, focusing mostly on the center of the rails. You'll start to get a bit of a feel for how much you need. My advice would be start off with less at the start and then you can add more a lot easier than it is to take it away. Once you've got some kind of roughly placed down, then use a paintbrush or some other tool to spread it out and very quickly it will start to look quite neat. I have made life slightly difficult for myself by having the tunnel down. It means it's a little bit awkward to get the spoon and the paintbrush in there, but luckily the tunnel's not very long, it's only 30-40mm, so it's not too bad for me to get the spoon and the paintbrush in there. It's worth taking your time here to get the ballast as neat as possible with the paintbrush. Obviously once the glue's down you're not going to be able to correct any mistakes so focus on the outside of the rails and getting a neat line of ballast on either side. I'm adding in a little bit of darker ballast which I'm going to use for the rest of the layout at this stage because that means I can blend it in nicely with the lighter ballast which obviously won't be possible once it's all glued down. And then we're going to come in with the spoon, this time with no ballast on it, and tap the tops of the rails. This helps to shift any loose ballast off and gives a more realistic look as in real life the locomotives would basically vibrate the rails to the point where the ballast falls off. You can see here that there is a small hole on this side of the closest rail. 
That's where one of the dropper wires goes through the baseboard, and it seems like the ballast is draining through there. I think I'm going to have a bit of a nasty surprise when I flip the layout over and I'm probably going to find a whole load of ballast underneath the baseboard, but oh well. For now I'm going to get it all glued down and then later on we're going to go back and actually fill those holes where the drop wires go, but it's not going to cause us a big issue for now. Once we're happy that the ballast is smooth and even and nice and neat, we're going to come in with some isopropyl alcohol, I'm using 99%, and apply it very, very carefully with a pipette. I didn't like spraying, I do have little spray bottles, but it just seemed to make a big mess and actually shifted the ballast around more than using this pipette. The method I use is to apply the alcohol directly to the rail and allow it to run off into the ballast. We want to make sure it's nice and soaked because the alcohol is what will draw the thin PVA through the ballast and make sure that we don't just have a layer of glue on the top, we actually have the ballast forming one solid homogeneous chunk. Now we're going to add the glue. I've put the glue into a yogurt pot with a few drops of fairy liquid to help break the surface tension. We're going to add the glue very steadily, one drop at a time, focusing on applying it directly to the rails and letting it wet down into the ballast. If we apply it directly, we're going to disturb the ballast and have some unsightly marks. Keep going and add as much glue as you can before it starts to overflow, and that's at the point where you've got the right amount. To fill in the holes where we're losing ballast where the drop wires go through, I'm just going to use a little bit of blue tech. It doesn't look necessarily too neat, but it's nice and simple. Just push it in with your finger and then come back in with an Allen key or some other tool and make sure it's pressed in there nice and good. That should solve our problem of having little holes in the ballast where the dropper wires are. So that's the first lot of ballast done. Uh, as you saw, we filled in the holes where the dropper wires were with blue tack to stop that going through. I uh, added a bit more ballast and then did that second coat of just glue on its own. Well, glue with fairy liquid. Um, I didn't use any alcohol though. And it's dried pretty hard. So now I'm going to continue moving from this side over to the other side and everything else is going to be done with the sort of dark grey black ballast uh, this stuff from Wooden Scenics but I'm not going to do everything yet because I'm waiting on a couple of detail pieces around the points uh, I've got little levers like scale levers which are going to go there um, just to try and like kind of hide because the ballast is going to be weird around these because there's going to have to be gaps for those sliders to move so yeah I'm going to leave a, a decent area around there um, but apart from that I'm just going to start working my way across and uh, finishing up the ballast. Here we can see the ballast in once it's almost done. As you can see I've used the darker colour stuff from Woodland Scenics and it's all gone down pretty nice. It's looking a little bit fresh everywhere and doesn't necessarily suit the rather rusty condition of the rails. So at some point I'm going to come back in and tone down the colour and add a little bit of variation as well. But for now, it looks good. I ended up getting bored of waiting for the point levers to arrive. So I just ended up making some bespoke ones out of little pieces of brass rod. They sit on these little rectangles which I made from spare sleepers from the track. They help to keep the point levers out of the ballast which A looks more realistic and stops them disappearing under all those granules. I was trying to find a good building to use as a small goods yard but the offerings in N-Gage are very limited. So I ended up converting this 
Metcalf kit which is designed as a single track engine shed into my goods depot. I've added a loading dock and a ramp and some other interior features to try and hide the fact that it is essentially an engine shed and I've also included three big double bay doors which I think look pretty nice. At this point it wasn't finished and I'm actually in the process of adding LED lighting to it to add a bit of life to the layout. So that's where we're going to end this episode. We've got the baseboard extended, we have weathered the track, got the ballast down and even started looking at a couple of buildings. Next episode we're going to continue with the scenery work and things are going to start transforming pretty quickly from a weird brown block into something that hopefully resembles a real life goods depot. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.